So what then is the role of microbiota in obesity? Have microbiota changed along with the change of human shape, which implies other questions. Do microbiota impact on our health and are our eating habits influenced by microbiota so that we are in fact the slaves of our microbiota and resulting from that? An implication can a change in microbiota by an easy way with probiotics help in reducing weight or by a more advanced way of changing micro microbiota by fecal microbiota transplantation and what are the data which would support that. However, I first want to raise a word of caution we shall not send wrong messages to our patients by focusing discussion on microbiota if this would lead to the consequence that patients distract their attention from the important messages we want to <coughs> convey to them. And these important messages always will remain whatever we will do regarding obesity and that is decrease calories, increase activity. Now for the limited time I have available I will address some of these questions. The role of microbiota for obesity, potential influences of probiotics, and I will also touch upon fecal microbiota transplantation and in fact it's a pretty easy task to do because literature and very recent literature on these topics is abundant. And in the following slides I want to point out some of these references for you to study if you are interested in this topic. One important question is, what is the impact of gut microbiota on local and physical organs? And uh, how does this contribute to obesity development and uh, obesity progression? There is an excellent pr uh, publication in uh, protein cell published last year, 2018, you'll find the reference on the right up there, and that in fact very well summarizes the influences of bacteria on different organs, on the adipose tissue, on the liver, and on the brain. And it summarizes the mediators which are responsible for conveying these influences. Up there you see the line of the intestinal mucosa being inhabited by different kinds of bacteria which then produce different signals. Signals like the polysaccharides or short chain fatty acids which act on the adipose tissue, lipopolysaccharides, bile acid, short chain fatty acids, ethanol, choline acting on the liver with all of the consequences which this has in the liver and then other signaling which affects the brain. Now if you want to read up on that, this is a really good reference for you to study on this topic. Differences in microbiota and difference on the metabolic effects have been described when healthy gut microbiota to the left and obese diabetic microbiota to the right are described. They refer to influences on the epithelium, on the immune system, on the liver, where microbiota have different effects in the healthy person as compared to diabetic or obese patients.
This is information that we know, that we can address, that we can assess in the literature. Uh, however, uh, how common is this topic? How common is this problem? When we do in PubMed a search for uh, the keywords microbiota and obesity, I recently found 3,251 references related <coughs> to this topic. So if you really want to step into studying this topic, reliable reviews. Now, if it is already more than 3,000 pieces of information that we can assess, what then are the number of information lay population does assess? Whom does lay population, if they want to address microbiota and obesity, whom are they asking? They are asking Dr. Google. And that's in fact what you get if you type in, in Google, microbiota and obesity, you get more than 3,960,000 pieces of information. So be aware of that if you're taking care of patients with obesity, and be aware of that, that many of these informations, they get out of this information source, may be misleading, and this will also be a very important part of your taking care of these patients. Now coming back to the information we can assess, and I would want to, for this purpose, to point out this reference from the International Journal of Endocrinology, also from last year, which very well summarizes the gut microbiome profile in obesity. It has been a systematic review. Obesity is associated with different profiles of gut microbiota. Studies seem not to find enough consistency on the results, most probably because it can be influenced by several factors like different methodologies, growing data management knowledge, and so on. And, interestingly enough, Bariatric surgery intervention for weight loss impacts the gut microbiota composition, and these are the data from a very recently published study, GUTS 2019, just published a few weeks ago, which over the course of up to 12 months after bariatric surgery observed the uh, different bacterial populations in the gut that you see profound changes from time zero. In each of these graphs there is time zero at this point, the time of surgery, and the change over up to a, an observation period of 12 months after bariatric surgery. Another topic we, but also the public, may want to address in their sources of information. We in PubMed, the public in Google, is a combination of probiotics, obesity, and clinical trials. Now what does PubMed tell us? How, how big a number does it get us? Give up, it's 111. Now if you type in these search terms in Google, it's more than two million pieces of information, again, which are available to the public. We have, when we select our information from PubMed, for example, to clearly differentiate between those pieces of information which tell us about mechanistics of interaction between probiotics and uh, obesity. And this is an excellent review in Nutrients 2019, published a few weeks ago also, where in the upper slide you see mechanistics of different effects of probiotics on antimicrobial activity, 
on enhancement of barrier function, on immune modulation, and in the lower graph, see different effects of prebiotics, that is, the food for the bacteria which we provide to both inhabitant bacteria but also probiotic bacteria. The mechanisms of prebiotics are on bifidogenic effects, on decrease of luminal pH, on suppression of pathogenic bacteria, and on modulation of cytokine expression. That is also a very good reference for you to read up on that and summarize that if you are interested in that topic. However, this is mechanistics. To which extent does mechanistics, however, translate into clinically relevant outcomes? Several studies regarding probiotics in obesity have shown potential therapeutic effects of probiotics and or prebiotics a strain-specific effect on body weight and metabolism of the probiotic has been reported. However, identification of strains potentially associated with a beneficial effect is lacking. Systematic use cannot yet be recommended according to this recent review. And uh, for obesity treatment and associated metabolic disturbances, Dosage, duration of treatment, long-term effects of the administration of different strains are still a matter of research. And, most importantly, control of the diet as well as environmental and lifestyle factors that favor obesity development remain the best solution to problems related to weight gain. Now, coming to the third part, of the interaction between bacteria and obesity, which I had suggested to address, and that is fecal microbiota transplantation. I'm addressing that from the background of our clinical experience in our, uh, our university hospital in Graz on FMT and other indications. We do not have a study protocol on FMT in obesity. We have it for IBS, we have it for inflammatory bowel diseases, and we do it routinely in those severe res treatment resistant um, cases of C. difficile. How does it look for uh, obesity? Now, again, we address it again with the same approach. FMT, obesity, clinical trial. What does PubMed tell us? How many pieces of information do we get out of PubMed? <coughs> Five. Five pieces of, of information in PubMed if you type in FMT, obesity, clinical trial. Most importantly, trials are, and this is what you get out of Google, 68,000. Now, if you look into those, then there many of the, of some of these trials are still listed in the clinical trial, trials.gov web page, with where those trials which are ongoing uh, with regard to this topic are listed. So, there is, at this point of time, nothing to say about fecal uh, microbiota transplantation and uh, obesity. What has been happening since the 1980s? In fact, when you look at the time scale of the development, of the increasing prevalence of obesity in different countries, different regions of the world, the different regions of the world are color-coded in each of these slides. They relate to obese men, obese women, severely obese men, and severely obese women. We have had this change with this explosion of obesity only occurring, the timeline goes here back to 1980, only in the last 
two or three decades. So what has happened since the 1980s? Is it really an invasion of the body snatchers? Some strange bacteria, some bad bacteria which have invaded us in the last 20 or 30 years? Or is it the overboarding of <laughs> bad habits? Well, the Surgeon General of the United States addressed the goals of supporting implementation strategies that are grounded in scientific and practice-based evidence. He calls for an action by multiple sectors of society with regard to the Step It Up initiative, the call to action to promote walking and walkable communities, which may be a very important point to start with. He's a calls for acts in transportation, in land use, in community design, in fitness and education, in business and industry, volunteer, non-profit, media, and public health, families, and individuals. So I close the circle and come back to what I initially started with. Are we the slaves of our bacteria, or do we keep control of our lives and where do we and our patients need the support in controlling their lives and preventing the obesity epidemic. Now, in summary, gut microbiota in obesity, there is a key role as a modulator of energy homeostasis and fat deposition. There is the composition of the gut microbiota in obese subjects which differs from that in lean individuals. An association of dysbiosis with obesity and related metabolic problems has been shown both in animals and in humans. However, which gut microbiota components are the cause of weight gain and abnormal glucose and fat metabolism and which are protective against obesity and metabolic derangement, that is still under investigation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hans, for this excellent lecture. You have seen a, a presentation based on evidence. Questions of Professor Hahn from the audience. Uh, we, I, as the people are starting to send two questions. I, I, I reflected to the fact that we should be disappointed because in the last decade many <coughs> projects have been to study the microbiota. Even the horizon, no, there was framework eight, program framework eight. But the pragmatic progress in therapy or identifying subtypes or phenotypes of patients who, who respond to interventions in respect to probiotics and prebiotics are very, very little. So don't you think it's a big distance between the efforts on the study of microbiota and the outcomes? <coughs> it, it really is. Microbiota seems such a simple fix for many medical problems 10 years ago. However, we know it's not only the microbiome, it's the metabolome, uh, it's the genome of the bacteria which interact with the genome of, of our, our own genome, our genome of the body. So um, even the, the most extensive form of, of alteration of our microbiota in our human GI tract, and that is fecal microbiota transplantation, in many instances has not brought these results that we had in a simple way of thinking uh, expected. So there is much still to study on that and I personally believe that many of the medical problems we have may be associated with changes of the microbiome we harbor. However, 
we cannot expect simple and quick fixes. It will need hard work. And if we do this as a scientific community, I'm quite confident that in 10 years from now, we will be talking about microbiome and human health with different issues in a totally different and considerably higher level of evidence. Questions? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ryan, for this uh, great talk. We are looking forward uh, to this domain to offer a lot of answers to the questions we have or we will have in the future. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm having some information. It's anecdotically, but probably you are going to uh, confirm or not that some of the patients who needed small bowel transplantation that were not obese before and they received uh, this bowel from a patient that had been obese bef became obese, which is something connected probably with the microbiota. This is one. This is more light or anecdotic. And the other one is something that uh, every day is preoccupying us. Why, if we did the same surgery in different hospitals but to different patients, we cut in the same way, we have different results. And we qualified them responders and non-responders. Because there, at the level of the bowel, where the vagal receptors are, where the gut hormones are produced, it should be a difference that probably it, w it is connected with microbiota that we are carrying every one of us. Do you think that is there a clue? Because a lot of research has been launched these uh, years in this respect. And I'm looking forward to some of uh, those colleagues are going to uh, get and study the microbiota in uh, obese patients and bariatric patients after to look for solutions and probably in the end for a drug that is um, <coughs> being in exchange of surgery. Thank you, Ant. Yeah, Catherine, <coughs> you're, you're pointing out very important observations. I haven't heard about this transferring of obesity with, uh, with the, a small bowel transplantation, that's very interesting. I would rather assume, or I would give a high priority to thinking about endocrinological changes. The endocrino endocrinology we transplant with the bowel. In fact, <coughs> the bowel is a very complex organ, much more complex than a, than a transplanted heart is, for example. So that we really are transplanting, transplanting many functions associated with the small bowel in excess to what we shall think the bowel to do, that is digest and absorb nutrients. We are transferring much more signals than that. So it's a very interesting observation. And this would lead me much more to neuroendocrinology than the bacteria. However, those may, might be those might be true. So it's it's very interesting. And what was the second part of the question was uh, about the different uh, bi uh, microbioma in different patients, in different and they patients respond and differently. With, uh, responders and non-responders. Well, I think uh, you have uh, in the previous uh, presentations it was very well pointed out that there is no intervention, surgical or endoscopic, which can stand on its own. And this is the success, and now it's, it's not an appendectomy. You do a surgery and then you get a relief or a success. It is a multidisciplinary team approach, and it needs motivated patients. And I think there is much uh, to learn from that. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Hans. I appreciate and to Prosecutor's presentation. I have pleasure to introduce Professor Dick Gulescu, 